I, I can't see you, but I most certainly hope that you can hear me and that we can uh, continue to exchange some information tonight that's very important to the health uh, and breadth of this, of this nation uh, because there are many thousands of individuals who are in prison who should not be there because they were wrongfully convicted. And the depth and breadth of the problem is still not clear to any of us, never mind the many decades of study trying to determine just exactly how bad it is, but most certainly it is bad. Just check with the National Registry of Exonerations right on the top of their page of the information that is available to anyone. 2,667 individuals are now free and determined to be exonerated and no longer in prison trying to put their lives together uh, thanks to the work of uh, many people who are a part of a movement in the United States. Uh, when we started this year, we had at least 66 organizations that were working in this area of wrongful conviction, uh, essentially addressing actual innocence claims. But uh, we still aren't sure if it's only 2.5% or 5% of the nation's uh, 2.3 million prison population who are there for crimes they did not commit. We find them all the time. Yes, the headlines are ringing true because many, many people are inside who should not be there. Um, 1989 was when that number started to count. Uh, 1989 was the same a decade that DNA uh, became known to so many of us because um, we were coming up on the O.J. Simpson trial, but there were many others apparently uh, one in Florida, Andrews versus Florida, where uh, a court there was the first essentially to consider a DNA evidence. But please don't think that DNA is the savior for all of the people who happen to be in prison and arguing actual innocence. Uh, quite frankly, 60% of those uh, considered for uh, a new trial and release actually have no DNA component at all. So only 40% actually have some sort of level of science that might help someone get out of prison when they should not be there. Um, I should uh, let you know that um, this little item here is just a souvenir, but it's one that I look at all the time. Four words. I didn't do it. This was a souvenir from Centurion Ministries. It's uh, uh, the nation's first uh, organization to come together as a, as a nonprofit organization where they take no money from the people they try to help to get out of prison. So far, um, since they began in 1983, uh, they've got 63 people who are free thanks to their work. Um, but all over the country, that 66 number includes uh, law schools and nonprofit organizations that put together money for investigators, uh, those who do research, those who read uh, transcripts over and over again, trying to find the elements that might free someone who was in prison who should not be there. They are men and they are women. Uh, the majority of them are black, um, but it doesn't matter uh, race. Uh, the mistakes of government can happen just about anywhere, anytime, in any state, in any county. And yes, uh, there are some that are worse than others. Um, where I am in the state of Michigan, Wayne County is the one that uh, encompasses the city of Detroit. And for some reason, Wayne County and uh, what the police, the many police departments in that county have done over the years have left many, many people in prison uh, for crimes they didn't commit. But the fight most certainly continues. Um, we, we should take a look back, though, is how I got started uh, in looking at these things, because as a reporter, you do all kinds of different um, uh, stories over the years. But my first introduction to an actual innocence claim and a real case with real information didn't really come until 1994. And I actually started on television in 1974. Um, the guy had a strange name. Uh, his, his name is Temujin Kensu. And we're going to show you a fairly recent photo of Mr. Mr. Kensu, because uh, he is, in fact, uh, the person who got me started. He, of course, is there on the left, and Paula Randolph, the lady there with him, uh, is his fiance at this point. But uh, Temujin was, in fact, uh, many years ago married to another lady who married him in prison, who helped argue his case. Uh, but his case comes from Port Huron, Michigan, where um, a young man named Scott Macklin 
was shot to death just before nine o'clock in the morning, broad daylight on the campus of Port Huron Community College. At the time of that crime, and there were some witnesses who couldn't really put a, a number of things together because the assailant appears to have driven off before anybody could identify someone for, uh, in, in, in any real fashion. But Mr. Kensu was actually 400 miles away in Escanaba, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. And uh, no one can actually refute that, but the police seem to think, and they managed to convince a jury in court that he somehow fooled everybody, that no, those dozen or so witnesses that actually put him in Escanaba, uh, not far from Rock, where he and his uh, pregnant girlfriend at the time were staying, somehow he managed to fool everybody, come back to this area, 400 miles travel, and uh, use a shotgun to kill Scott Macklem just because they had some problem between the two of them with a girl. Um, it's really bizarre. There's a lot of information out there on the Temujin Kensu case. His real name is Frederick Thomas Freeman. Uh, but I got involved because um, a, uh, a grisly old private investigator uh, came to let me know that he had spent months talking to witnesses and connecting to people. His name is Al Woodside. And that picture, he's uh, 76 years old, still at it. Actually, I think by now he's probably 77, 78. But uh, Al is one of those guys who's um, a real stickler for detail. And when he found out various uh, bits and pieces of information on the Kensu case, how police uh, were involved in levels of uh, misconduct, uh, stealing property, doing drugs, uh, his, um, his um, defense attorney uh, was actually on crack cocaine and had problems uh, concentrating during the entire uh, trial. Uh, but he was convicted. And um, it's, uh, it, it's really been a struggle all these years for him, never mind all of his supporters, never mind all the media that we managed to bring to him. At one point, I actually uh, stepped away from my job for a few weeks uh, without pay uh, to try to run down who really killed Scott Macklem. Uh, we have some pretty good leads. We actually have a name or two, but we've never been able to get it into court to the point where Mr. Kinsu could be released at this point. We've approached the governor and many others, and that's always the struggle. Once a wrongful conviction takes place, uh, trying to reverse it is really, really difficult. I most certainly won't say impossible because yes, there are processes and procedures to get these people with actual innocence claims back into court, but it is absolutely not an easy thing to do. Um, I'll introduce you to another really difficult case that I was involved in. Um, uh, I guess almost from the very beginning. Um, I was still a reporter at the time, but uh, the young man here, uh, his name is Devante Sanford. And uh, Devante uh, actually went to prison at 14 years of age uh, because uh, he uh, essentially uh, confessed, at least the way the police structured it out. He confessed uh, to being a part of the Runyon Street Massacre, where four men and one woman was shot to death. One was shot, but she managed to survive and essentially claimed to know the voice of Devante Sanford, which was a part of getting him convicted. This photo was taken as uh, Devante was actually uh, standing on the, on the platform above the state legislature. They were actually in session. And uh, we were there on that day uh, as some of the people in the audience behind him actually came down and stood next to the governor as uh, a bill was signed here in the state of Michigan, one of a few around the country, where there is now compensation for those who are wrongfully convicted. But even saying that is kind of painful because I know that uh, even though that law has been in place for a little better than a year now, the people who make that claim, who are free and who have been adjudicated, either wrongfully convicted or wrongfully imprisoned, and at some point, uh, they may have been a part of that bad process. Well, only one out of eight people are actually receiving money from the state of Michigan. So you might say elements of the injustice continue even when it comes to trying to get compensation to the victims. Um, I'll take you now to uh, a place that uh, I'm connected to, not as a, <laughs> as a student or a graduate, but uh, the University of Michigan Law School. 
Uh, I'm one of the investigators who puts in a lot of time with some of their cases, and I have over the years. And so uh, at this yacht, it's just one of the celebrations at UM Law. And some of the people standing in this line happen to be professors uh, right there in the middle next to the fella, the tall fellow with the uh, University of Michigan hat is Professor Dave Moran. Uh, he is one of the founders of, uh, of the University of Michigan Law School's Innocence Clinic. Uh, there to the right is uh, Imran Saeed. He's one of the, uh, uh, the, one of the co-directors and uh, also a law professor. But I mentioned uh, Dave's name and point him out because uh, he um, and uh, our chief Supreme Court Justice in the state of Michigan, Bridget McCormack, um, are credited as uh, the founders of the Innocence Clinic at the law school. But uh, I happen to be the third person who was involved in that effort because I was chasing those two people, trying to get them to help, believe it or not, on the Kensu case. So they have been in business in the clinic for about 10 years now, and fortunately they have a couple of dozen people that they have freed. But once again, the depth and breadth of the problem is clear with the University of Michigan Law School because uh, they have as many as 6,000 cases in their files where people in Michigan prisons have asked for help. Uh, there's also Cooley Law School. Now, I can talk at this point on the difference between what amounts to a DNA house and a non-DNA house as far as an organization trying to help those who make actual innocence claims. Over at the Western University Cooley Law School, they actually are an innocence project where um, what they are looking at is DNA and scientific evidence. Over at the University of Michigan, they don't look at the science. Yes, there are elements of science in some of the cases, but they are not necessarily a science house. So when you think about organizations all around the country that essentially step up to help those people making actual innocence claims, um, there, there are lots of ways to approach it, but there's no doubt that uh, you do need the separate kinds of houses, some expert in scientific evidence and DNA, others that are just doing interviews, uh, chasing witnesses, uh, trying to determine if people were lying when they went to, uh, to take the stand and to testify against someone when they got a deal. There are lots and lots of different reasons, and we're going to talk about them at this point. The list is relatively short, but I can assure you that even though these six items that we're about to say uh, essentially are kind of at the top of the list of reasons for wrongful convictions, there are others. Uh, literally, we can talk about human frailty and how people uh, may be selfish in their own lives, their own hearts, actually do things to get the wrong person convicted, maybe just to close the case. But here's the list, um, and, and the list is, uh, as I said, relatively short, but um, uh, we start with eyewitness misidentification. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, we as human beings don't necessarily have photographic memories, and there's no doubt that many, many things happened in a situation where um, uh, you're, you're thinking that you've seen something, and maybe you haven't. And so eyewitness misidentification, when you pick someone out of a lineup and you think that that person is the one responsible, uh, our minds are just not like tape recorders. And there's no doubt that the witness memory is like any other evidence at a crime scene. It must be preserved carefully and retrieved methodically quickly. Uh, when you hear all those uh, stories about uh, uh, the 48 hours necessary to close major cases, there's no doubt that time is of the essence. Junk science is there as well. Uh, over the many decades past, you might have heard about bite mark testimony where, where uh, people in labs uh, look at, uh, at, at what injury might uh, a, a person might have suffered that looks like the bite mark that they could match. Well, that's been discredited in many, many other approaches in the old days uh, to try to get uh, science applied to um, a major crime investigation has literally been discredited and changed and tossed out and not even recognized by courts anymore. So junk science, one of the things as well. Believe it or not, false confessions is way up there because in many, many cases, there are people who are considering freedom and the fact that they're in police custody and they think that maybe what they say, if it sounds like a, a something that will help the police and help them get released, well, they'll say it. And it is a bad decision 
at some point during the interrogation process, thinking that the confession might make the police happy, but it's never, never, ever a good idea. Government misconduct. Now we're back to human frailty and what people might do just to get a conviction. And yes, there are police who will lie. And yes, there are prosecutors who will withhold evidence. And yes, there are judges who might have their own biases to look at a case and decide in a way that's really not fair. That's government misconduct. Snitches is uh, one of the ones that hits me in the gut because many, many of my cases have to do with information that essentially came from someone on the inside of prison claiming that the cellmate or someone they ran into had something to say that is incriminating. In so many of those cases, the snitches are trying to get better deals for themselves and they are not doing anything that uh, is lawful. And by the time it's all over, they can get someone in a lot of trouble that shouldn't be there. And then they're off on their newly found, newly earned freedom. And it's not fair to the person who ends up in prison for the crime they didn't commit. Bad lawyering is there too. There are a lot of people who start uh, with, with good intentions in law schools and they learn well. Uh, but once you get into practice and you find out how difficult it is to make money as a lawyer, apparently around the country, the average is somewhere between 45 and $50,000 a year. Um, it's a struggle for them to stay alive. And so maybe they take on too many cases just to make sure they can pay the mortgage and the car payment. And so they don't do what they need. Finding uh, expert witnesses, uh, essentially finding an investigator to have them hit the street and to support the innocence claim in a way that leads to a not guilty verdict. Well, bad lawyering is most certainly there. So that's the six, the ones that we see most often, the ones that have made the list. But yes, there are other things that can happen to, to lead to a wrongful conviction. There's no doubt about that. Um, I can tell you that the women are most certainly not immune uh, when it comes to what can happen uh, in wrongful convictions. The, the little lady there at my shoulder, that's Lorinda Swain. Uh, some years back, um, she had a drug problem. And at the same time, she had adopted two boys. Well, uh, her problem and uh, making the older of the two boys, uh, Ronnie, uh, not feel that he was loved or cared for. And mama would kind of go off in a bad way on occasion. He was hoping to get her some help. And so he talked to grandparents who had another motive who suggested that maybe he should turn mama in to police for molestation, that he and his brother were essentially taken to bed by mom and there was kissing and this, that, and the other. And yes, she was convicted and was about to serve 25 to 50 years in prison. Well, that's one of those uh, cases that uh, I got wind of when Ronnie, the teenager, decided to talk to me and another reporter in the state of Michigan, and we aired that story and uh, the uh, levels of misconduct by the prosecutors and police eventually came uh, to fruition. And this was one of the first cases, Lorinda's, was one of the first cases taken on by the University of Michigan Law School. Um, she uh, managed to get out but had to wear a tether for quite some time, um, another expense for her and her family. Uh, but eventually, uh, the judge, the original judge in the case, uh, came to terms with the fact that some of the evidence was just not supported by fact that the kids had lied uh, and that uh, neighbors had actually seen the children out getting on a bus when the alleged misconduct uh, in the morning before they went to school was allegedly taking place. So yes, uh, Lorinda is free. Uh, Lorinda was a person who won a nice settlement, $1.9 million for her wrongful conviction and time in prison. Uh, she was only in maybe six, eight years, but um, she is one of the few that managed to get some compensation. Um, in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, the media has paid a lot of attention to these cases because there are more of them. Uh, the cases are much more egregious. And uh, that leads to the next case where the young man standing next to me in this um, eventually was released from prison in the picture on the left. That's Lamar Munson on the day that he was released after 20 years in prison for murder. 
it was uh, an ugly case that essentially I uh, was a part of back when he was arrested. Uh, Mr. Munson uh, was charged and convicted, uh, actually another one of those who made the mistake of talking to police, of killing a 12-year-old girl. Um, it was back in the, in the days when crack cocaine was taking over everything, and that 12-year-old female was uh, actually selling drugs on Mr. Munson's behalf. Well, um, a drug consumer that night, uh, literally after not getting drugs for free, uh, bludgeoned the girl to death uh, with a toilet tank top. That big ceramic heavy thing was the weapon. So she was bludgeoned to death and because Munson was there at the scene, actually called the police, tried to get help for his, his protege, uh, he ended up uh, in prison for her murder. Well, that's his mother with him and uh, his, uh, his fingers on his chin. I guess he was still trying to come to terms with the fact that finally after 20 years, he had been released from prison. And that picture on the right with me standing uh, next to him, we're outside of the court where a judge has just deemed him free. Um, that was probably three years uh, after his uh, initial release. He too was on a tether. And uh, Mr. Munson is still trying to get compensated, but uh, he's doing uh, well. He, uh, he has a, uh, a private company doing some, uh, some work around uh, houses and apartment buildings uh, for uh, renovations. And um, he and his lawyer are still waiting and hoping that eventually uh, he will find himself in a position where he too has received some money based on what he suffered in prison. Um, you'll, you'll know the name of Barry Sheck, I'm sure, because uh, he is the person who uh, was on the dream team for O.J. Simpson. And uh, in that particular uh, part of his career, it was Barry Sheck who essentially dismantled uh, the value and the efficacy of DNA science and used it to help O.J. Simpson get off in the murder that most of us know he committed. Um, and so um, uh, Barry is, is essentially one of, the, one of the centerpieces for the national effort in the, in, the, in the work that we all do in actual innocence claims and wrongful conviction. And he and Peter Neufeld uh, head up the Innocence Project in New York. Uh, that's kind of our, our, our hub, uh, kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the beehive for, for all of us around the country who continue to work uh, in the very difficult efforts of trying to get innocent people out of prison. And uh, they collect information that is dispensed to all of us uh, once a year um, in, in an innocence conference. Uh, we've, uh, we've been to Atlanta, we've been to San Francisco. Uh, we were supposed to go to Chicago this year, but of course COVID-19 essentially shut that down. But um, it is difficult work because it is a part of law. And unless you can get law to change or to bend or to listen, wrongful convictions will continue to happen. In this next picture, um, uh, there, there's an interesting shot. It's one where the young man holding his uh, one-year-old daughter was only 21. Uh, Walter Swift back then was kind of an incorrigible. Uh, yes, he had done some small crimes, but then um, he was arrested for a home invasion where a woman a pregnant woman was raped. Um, in Walter's case, uh, there was a female detective who spent a full week with him um, and running around chasing all of the various information about the case, what evidence there existed. There was DNA that did not match Walter Swift. But as soon as that detective essentially walked away from the case thinking she had done her job, cleared Walter Swift, she went on vacation and two men in that same investigative unit decided to go back after Walter. And the result was him spending 26 years in prison for that crime that he did not commit. The picture on the right is that same child. Uh, after he was released, she was about 30 at that time, Audrey Swift, and she was there with dad on the day that he was released. So was I. And uh, your dedication to this cause, some sometimes has you take major steps in life. Uh, at this moment, and essentially since Walter received 
$2.3 million in a settlement from the city of Detroit, I became his trustee. And I've been working very hard to walk, walk Walter back towards a real life, a complete life. Unfortunately, Walter has a serious crack cocaine problem. And even now he's in Vermont and, uh, and back in prison. He's been in treatment centers dozens of times. Um, but we will continue to try to do all we can for Walter. Um, but it is uh, one of those more difficult situations for me because <laughs> uh, being a trustee is not an easy thing when the person that you're trying to help is on drugs. It is not easy at all. So I'm, uh, I'm so happy to be able to expose you folks to cases that I know of, but just understand that these things usually have structure. You don't necessarily find yourself on the right side of the law. If there are people on the inside applying laws that just are not fair, putting together evidence that really doesn't exist from snitches and people who are willing to lie just so just so the prosecutor and the police can strike another notch on, on their gun. Um, but at this point, we should, we should uh, talk about a reason to, to smile and essentially be saddened by another case, believe it or not. It started in February of 1973. Uh, the man I'm talking about here is Raymond Felton Gray. Um, he was in prison at the time he did this painting. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's Einstein. But uh, uh, Ray, um, at the time, was a, a, a boxer. He was about to turn pro. He made money on the side by actually doing hair. He was a hairdresser. He had lots of women who essentially he, uh, he uh, made look beautiful. And he, at the same time, was accepted, about to go into uh, a fairly prestigious art school. All those things in place for Raymond Felton Gray when he unfortunately tied himself to the wrong female. Uh, an 18 year old who had a drug problem and who apparently did in fact uh, orchestrate robberies that had to do with drugs. And February 3rd, 1973, she and two men went into an apartment and robbed a fellow named Reuben Bryant and during that robbery, there was a scuffle, and one of those men actually fired two shots into Reuben Bryant, killing him. And um, unfortunately, the three women who were witness to that, only one decided to pick Ray out of a lineup and go into court and testify that Ray favors, looks like the man who did the robbery and fired the fatal shots. Well, um, I can tell you at this point that there are two men who are actually responsible for that robbery. Um, one of them is a fellow named Charlie Matthews. And Mr. Matthews was the man who was armed that night. And his friend, Tyrone Pugh, the two of them had been uh, doing robberies in whatever way they could. They would take purses from women. They would uh, rob stores. They would do anything because they both had drug problems. Charlie Matthews eventually died of a drug overdose. Tyrone Pugh was shot to death in gunfire exchanged with police at the end of a, another robbery. I was not able to convince the Wayne County prosecutor, Kim Worthy, to consider Charlie Matthews while he was alive to at least have a discussion with Charlie Matthews because he is in fact the man who did that robbery and who essentially in 1980 signed an affidavit saying that yes, he knows what happened there. He wanted to blame his brother and Tyrone and the girl, he said, but Charlie never really stepped up. And so Charlie's dead, Tyrone is dead. And so what do we do for Ray? Well, Ray has been doing for himself for almost 50 years. 47 years, Ray has been a prolific artist, one of the best inside the Michigan prison system. We'd like to show you the rabbi, one of those who uh, is, um, has done really well for Ray. He, um, we've been trying to sell as many paintings as we can so that um, we can pay for his lawyer at the point. But there's, there are many of Ray's paintings that, uh, that are very impressive. 
um, uh, the University of Michigan apparently has an art school and they, they present some of the units that I'm showing you now. Um, but all of what you're seeing here uh, would be available on the Ray Gray Art Gallery website. And uh, you can spend as little as uh, $50 for some of the smaller prints, 1500 for the larger ones. But obviously he is a very, very talented man. And should you see something that you like in any of these, these paintings, these reproductions here, you, uh, you should let us know because we most certainly can get you prints. You will find that um, we're trying to raise this $15,000. So there is a GoFundMe page. And there's also uh, his artwork that's available through several websites, including ours. Uh, you might have uh, seen, I have this little logo on my chest. It says Seeking Justice. Well, seekingjusticebp.com is where you can find uh, a number of, um, uh, uh, well, actually a way to click and go to the, uh, the GoFundMe page for Ray. And um, that uh, Seeking Justice BP also gives you an idea of, uh, of our advocacy, uh, cases that we follow, cases that we are fighting for, including Ray's. Uh, I have at least 12 cases that are we're underway right now. And what I do in my work essentially is to find a combination of documents, uh, witnesses, uh, people who might have said the wrong thing along the way, who may have been intimidated by police. So all of these are a part of what you might want to go to later. But um, at this point, I'm just really happy to have been able to spend a little time with you to give you some insight into a very difficult subject. Um, in this day and time, uh, we hear Black Lives Matter. And there are many, many Black lives inside serving time for crimes they did not commit. It is a very difficult part of the criminal justice system because laws that are in place <clears throat> that put people in prison for something they didn't do are difficult to uh, reverse. And um, so yes, we try to get people back in court for new trials and those orders do come. And in many cases, the uh, prosecutors decide not to attempt the trial. And obviously in Ray's case, it would be impossible to put together a case against Ray because uh, all of the witnesses essentially are dead. Um, the scenario could not be proven. Uh, the witness essentially made a mistake. And um, unfortunately, the young judge who heard the case, the very young and new uh, prosecutor, a former Detroit police sergeant, her first capital case, the young defense attorney, one of his first major cases, all three young people made this horrible mistake that at this point has taken most of Ray's life. Well, we're hoping that we are right at the edge of taking a big step towards uh, Ray's release, if not exoneration. Tomorrow, I'm actually going to uh, have a conversation with and hopefully get identifications from the last surviving victim of the robbery from February 1973. Her name is Barbara Hill. And we hope to have Barbara point to some pictures that identify both Charlie and Tyrone and with those identifications, that will be about the third cog in a wheel that we hope to get into court and convince a judge in Wayne County, Michigan, that Ray Gray should at minimum get a new trial order, if not be immediately released, because he didn't do it. Keep those words in mind when the issue of wrongful conviction comes to you, because all of these situations involve people, their families, their employers, the people who would much rather see those folks working in the community and paying taxes and supporting their families. But their lives have been stolen based on a criminal justice system that in many cases doesn't pay attention. In many cases is lazy or just trying to get another notch on the gun. So thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully there are some uh, questions out there and I'm hoping to be able to answer them. But uh, yes, it is a tough subject. Hopefully we haven't uh, brought you down too much, but uh, by the same token, you just saw some beautiful artwork uh, done by a man who, uh, who uh, has a great deal of talent. His life stolen, but he is prolific just the same. Thank you so much. Alice.